Hey, everybody. If you're just coming in, uh, I'm sad to inform you that this is, I am not Christian Hemsworth, and this is not the three o'clock show of Thor Ragnarok. That's next door. You're going to hear it a lot over the next hour, so just imagine what you're missing while you're listening to me instead. My name is Brandon Satram, and I'm a writer. I write books, and I write JavaScript. That's what I've done for the last uh, 18 years, and I want to talk to you today about ECMAScript, about next generation modern JavaScript. And I'm going to try to fit about eight years worth of JavaScript standards development into the next 60 minutes. And I have two goals for you today, because I'm going to cover a lot of stuff very quickly. I'm not diving deep on anything. I want to survey the landscape. My first goal is that every single one of you walks away with at least one thing that you hadn't heard before that is a surprise to you, that you're like, wow, that's cool. I didn't know JavaScript could do that. That's the first thing. The second thing is to leave with at least one thing to follow up on. I'm not going to give you in-depth knowledge about anything, but if you think something's interesting, like, wow, symbols, that's really cool. Generators, I need to start using that. Write it down, go to MDN, do a Google search, follow up. You're going to find it really interesting. So those are my goals. And with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I have very few slides in this talk because I want to spend most of my time actually in the editor, actually executing code and showing you what's happening uh, across the language in these changes. Uh, much like uh, Burke Holland did this morning, I'm using Visual Studio Code, but I'm actually using it correctly with a dark theme so that my eyes uh, do not fall out of, my, out of my face by the end of the day. Thank you. I hear some applause. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I want to actually start by talking about new variables. I'm sure many of us are familiar uh, and have felt the pain of using var and issues with hoisting and uh, variables leaking into the global namespace over the year. We now have two other uh, variable types that we can use, let and const. So uh, in this example, what I've done is I've created three different variables. I have a name, I have a global let name, and a global const name. And one of the, and I'm trying to reassign to it. Oh, man, I just totally ruined my own demo. So, uh, so I have values assigned to each of these. And the difference between, there's key differences here. The key difference between let and const is that let can be reassigned to. So I can change the global let name to something else. Uh, but I cannot change global const name to anything else. A constant is as it sounds. A const. I cannot reassign it. I cannot rebind it. There is a quirk to that. I'll talk about it in just a second. That is one of the critical differences. One of the other critical differences is actually how let and const behave inside of blocks, which is always one of the weird annoyances about var, is that var tends to get hoisted outside. It is not block scoped. It is function scoped. It is module scope, very, uh, scoped inside of its containing class, what have you. Uh, and var and const, excuse me, let and const actually behave differently. So here I have three values, name from scope var, name from scope let, name from scope const. And see if I can access any of these. Name from scope var, I can. That should come as no surprise. And let and const, I cannot. Uh, you'll see in just a second, this actually ends up being kind of useful in a lot of different ways. It's nice to know that we can actually use variables, not just inside of functions, but inside of conditionals, inside of other blocks. And those will actually stay inside of that scope uh, as we prefer them to. Now, one of the things that's interesting about const is that const is not about immutability per se. It's actually about assigning a binding to an object once and then no longer changing that binding. So for instance, if I have something, if I have a const in this case with a full name and I change it from my name to Burke Holland, what you'll see is, I'll refresh, is that I'm trying to assign to a constant variable that doesn't work. We saw that already, right? But if I create a constant object, and let's say in this case, I'm going to do that. In this case, I'm creating a person object. Uh, and I'm going to write that out to the console. By the way, if you've never seen console.table, very cool way to actually spread out the values of an object in the console in a nice way. Uh, and I can actually, uh, what I cannot do is then take this and put another person on that const, right? I cannot rebind that to a brand new object or any function literal. But what I can do is actually give that a nickname, right? Um, so Berkasaurus, that's your nickname, right? Ber Berkasaurus, OK, yeah. Uh, refresh that. So now I have not changed the binding, but I do have the ability to add additional properties onto that. Uh, this is really useful, and it's actually quite nice to default the const in this sense, because you can use it for 
uh, objects and know when you're creating most most of the time when you're creating objects you're creating an object that you want to you don't want it to be rebound but you do want ability to transform to update state to modify the object const is still a good choice one of the other ways where uh, these new variable types actually help us a great deal is in replacing our good friend the immediately invoked function expression or the iffy. Uh, I'm sure many of you will remember a, a time over the years where you have tried to access a variable inside of a loop and what you've ended up with, let me delete all that, what you've ended up inside of the console is you've pushed a value, uh, pushed a function that needed a variable that was accessible only inside of a for loop, you pushed it into the function and then when you printed it out to the console ultimately what you ended up getting was nothing. Let me go back to this really briefly. Make sure I am on the right file. All right. I don't know why that's not working right now. Uh, so in this case, what ends up happening when you, when you console log out the i variable, you get 10 printed out to the console 10 times. Uh, because when that ends up being evaluated, the value of i is 10 because, excuse me, because in the case of var, Anybody catch my mistake? In the case of var, the value is uh, the value is 10 by the time those functions are executed because var is not block scoped. However, because I because let is block scoped, what I end up getting instead is what I prefer to get, which is the uh, the actual value 0 through 9 printed out to the console. We typically we used to solve this problem with the if everybody remembers this. It has a lot of unsavory names as well. We basically pass in the value of the iterator val of, of the uh, the looping variable into the function so that you're actually passing in 0, 1, 2, 3, instead of just a reference pointer to i that then gets accessed later. And in this case, you actually do get the values correctly. But when you use let, you get the same result as the iffy, but you actually get something that's more readable, uh, something that is more, uh, more maintainable ultimately in the long term, which is nice. Uh, and so, Again, this improves the state of your for loops in one way, especially when you're accessing internal values. But let also gives us something else interesting when it comes to for loops uh, that we may not be aware of. Probably some of us have been burned by in the past. And this is with the, the i, j, k variables that we tend to use for iterators. Uh, when we use these values, what happens to the value i is that it's, again, because it is not block scoped, I can access the i outside of the loop. But if instead I use a let statement and have a variable of j, excuse me, and I refresh that, I get different values, 4, 5, and 6, I cannot log j out to the console. j is not defined, again, because it's not scoped outside of the for loop. Things are cleaned up properly. Everybody's happy. Crap code doesn't leak out of your application. So those are your new variable types. Um, now let's talk about arrow functions. Another basic but an interesting one to talk about is how we traditionally did function declaration and assignment versus the power that arrow functions give us today. So we had two ways traditionally to define functions. We could do a function declaration, function name, and then the body of the function. We could refer it, we could call it, we could uh, write it out to the console, do funny things with it. Uh, we could also create function assignment, which became increasingly common. Uh, assign, the, assign a function to a variable, and then take that, it's portable, take it anywhere, assign it to an actual function. The arrow function syntax gives us something uh, quite interesting in simplifying that. Um, anybody ever spend any time messing around with CoffeeScript? At all back in the day, I loved CoffeeScript. I was a CoffeeScript fan person for a while. Uh, and uh, and I, this is one of the JavaScript syntax changes that I'm really happy to have. While not exactly the same, the arrow function syntax has a lot of benefits. On face, it's not that much different. You're dropping the function uh, name and you're getting to use this equal sign greater than and a return value. But the beauty of the arrow function syntax is that it's actually quite uh, flexible. You can use it. <coughs> Uh, in a lot of ways as single line. You can have, there's a single line version as well. The return is implicit uh, if it's a one line function. And if you don't have, uh, if you only have a single line, you actually don't need to provide the curly braces. And where this actually ends up becoming useful is when you're doing things like maps and reduce, and you're basically using arrow functions inside of callbacks where you're manipulating objects over time. And there's a lot of different ways that you can look at that. Uh, this example, I'm using the map, uh, the map function to map over a series of values, and I'm going to just return that name computed with the members of my family's last name. 
Uh, this is the traditional way to do it. With an arrow function, you're just passing in the name without the word function, the arrow, the return. Again, like we just saw, we can make this simpler. If you only have one parameter in a function, you don't need to use the open and close parentheses at all. Again, like I mentioned, if you don't have multi-line, you can drop the, uh, uh, the uh, curly braces and drop the return. And then if you don't have any params, you actually need to use the, uh, you actually do need to use the parentheses. And if you have two, more than one, you do need to use the parentheses as well. So those things are both, uh, that's sort of the general rules of that. While we're on the topic of arrow functions, it's interesting to talk about default values because they do tend to play a role a lot of times together. Uh, default argument values are something that we have typically solved in the past by checking, checking inputs that come in from a function when we don't entirely know who's going to be calling that function from the outside. So if we were creating a calculate bill uh, function back in the old days, what we would do is we'd say total tax tip. We would check the values that we just weren't sure that were going to be passed every time and then pass in defaults. Uh, if we knew we were going to have those. The new way is that we take these two statements, we actually put our defaults right in line on the function uh, declaration, and we can use those anyway. And so what ends up happening when we use this calculate bill function, on default arguments. So if I call calculate bill and I say $100, and 0 0.825, and then I don't pass in a final value, it will take the value that I've provided in the function and just calculate a tip of 20%. Uh, if I just want to do calculate bill with one value, I do, I get a different value. If I just call calculate bill, that will fail because I have not, or give me not a number, uh, because I did not specify total as a default value. Now, if I ever have a situation where I don't want to pass in, I want to pass in the first value and the third value, but I don't want to pass in the second value, that's not going to work. I can't just leave, you know, commas all over the place. Nobody wants that. Uh, I also should not pass in null because that is not going to trigger the default. Null is a, it is a value. You are providing a value of null. So what do I need to do instead? What I need to do is actually in that case say undefined. And if I do that, then my third default will work. So that's a bit of a, an FYI, something to know about when it comes to dealing with defaults. Now, with arrow functions, there are really, uh, there's four different, a uh, couple of things that I want to say about arrow functions. There's four places uh, you cannot use arrow functions, or you should not use it depending on your context. I think it's good to try to use them by default because they are syntactically clean. You can expand them later on if you need. If you need to use this, this has no meaning inside of an arrow function unless you explicitly provide it. Um, when you need a method to bind to an object, when you need to add a prototype method, or finally when you need to use the arguments object, everybody's wonderful favorite array-like, but not really an array arguments object. I'll look at, show you an example of each of those here in a second. I've got a button uh, on this page here uh, that when you click is supposed to give you some sort of a behavior. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, I'm going to add a uh, query selector to this, and I'm going to add a click function, and it's an arrow function, that it's going to tell me whether or not class list is on this in my arrow function. So I'm going to add an event listener for that. We save that, and that's going to log that out to the console. Refresh the page, click the button, and it's going to tell me false. Right? So this is not available. Now, I am able to use a full function inside of here, and the toggle will actually work, right? Um, I can't have this. That's a case where I need to resort back to, if I need this, to using a real function as opposed to using uh, just an arrow function. The second example is when you need a method to actually bind to an object. So if I have an object literal, and it's got a couple of functions here. I have one arrow in the second example, and then one traditional function declaration in the third. Uh, the way that these things work with my person object is if I can say person, person, 28. If I say person not have birthday, now I know that person is 29. If I say person dot, what's my age again? That's undefined because I am, again, attempting to use this uh, inside of that function to determine this dot age, and that's not available. The third thing is when I need to add a prototype method. So let's say I'm using prototypal inheritance. Uh, I have a function for car with the make and color. I uh, create two of those new 
a BMW, and a Subaru. And then I add a summarized method to that that gives me values from, again, this. This is, again, a byproduct of needing to use this inside of there. And then the final example is using the arguments object. If you're doing a, uh, if you are doing an arrow declaration, or excuse me, if you're doing an arrow function and attempting to use the arguments object because you don't know how many values you're going to get in from uh, the caller of the function, this is going to fail. It's going to tell you that the arguments object is null. In fact, if I call that right now with the children, is it what order children? Right, arguments is not defined. That's what we expected. So those four cases are something to pay attention to when it comes to um, where did my uh, did my explorer window go? Okay. Uh, when it comes to using arrow functions, next let's talk about template strings. There's another basic, but I think an important one to cover because who who didn't who has had to write very very awful string concatenation logic like this in the past. Raise your hand if you have. Hopefully all of you have because it's a rite of passage. And 10 years from now when these youngsters come up here and they're talking about how great JavaScript is, you'll be like, well, listen, you don't know. Let me tell you about what it was when I was writing like ES3 code. It was crap. So this string concatenation logic is everywhere. It's all over the web and it's awful to use. Another one of the things that I loved about CoffeeScript that did make its way into the language, you know, let's, let's take credit for it, CoffeeScript fans, was the string interpolation functionality that we now have inside of template strings. And so uh, when we take the same, and so I have basically a list of beers here, some of my personal favorites, and I'm iterating over those and I'm basically just console logging those out. And with a template string, I get something that's a lot cleaner. It's basically back ticks at the start and finish. This gives me a couple of benefits. One is that I don't need to escape single and double, double quotes anymore. I can use those to my heart's content. It's just fine. And the other is that I can interpolate values from variables and other objects by using dollar sign, open and close, curly brace, and I'm good to go. Uh, this is fantastic. And the beauty of it is I can call functions. I can perform complex functionality. Uh, I can also in, embed... Uh, string templates inside of other string templates. So it makes it easier for me to do conditional interpolation. So adding markup to a screen, uh, uh, and this is something that if you're a React developer, um, like I am, you'll use this a lot. It ends up being a very nice way to uh, keep things, that the, the output of HTML inside of functions, inside of JavaScript, still looking really nice. Uh, while being able to do conditional logic. So in this case, what I'm actually doing is determining if one of the values of my object is over 10, so if it's a high ABV beer, I'm going to tag it with a little bit of extra information uh, and add this out to the screen. And I can use template screens as well to render functions. And so you can do a lot of complex logic with this. This is single template strings. It's template strings within template strings and functions as well. Uh, this is really, uh, it's really fantastic that we have this capability now um, inside uh, inside of ECMAScript. So let me, let me explore. It keeps closing out on me. Um, one thing that's very interesting that I like about template strings that I'm hoping is going to be sort of the, wow, I wasn't really aware of that kind of thing, is the ability to use tagged templates. Uh, I think this is actually really darn cool. So let me go to this example right here. Comments is not defined. All right, 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 right. Excuse me. So I have some comments on the screen. It's just a typical, no, I got the wrong ones. It's just a typical set of comments that you would find on YouTube. Um, you know, the, the usual kind of comments that people have to say about uh, any kind of video that you want to post. doesn't really matter what the topic is. You're going to have people that come out and say nice things about you. Uh, and so I want to actually, you can actually use something called tag templates to, uh, to actually help you sanitize certain kinds of values. So I want to take these strings and do something a little bit different to them. So I'm creating a function uh, that actually accepts two things. The way that a tag template works is you create a function that accepts uh, an array of literals, and then a set of substitutions. 
Those substitutions are actually the rest of the arguments in, and I'll talk about what that dot, dot, dot means in a bit. It's a rest parameter. I'm getting another value that has each of those. And I'm looping over each one of those literals, and I'm just going to replace the unkind words that hurt my feelings in that comment with some other words that might potentially make me smile. And the way that those are called, which is actually kind of interesting, you see it here, but the way that those are called is just by putting the name of that substitution function right next to the beginning of the uh, template literal. You don't open close uh, parentheses. It's a little bit of an odd syntax, but that's ultimately how you say, take this string literal right here. And notice I've got one even embedded, a different one. Take just this little piece of the string and send it off to this other function with the values and then return me the result. And in that case, I get much better comments uh, for all my YouTube videos. So um, I'll, I'll check that into GitHub and star it and so we can all you know, put, that, put that in everything. Um, so that's, that's, and I'm not going to spend any more time on strings. I want to move on to destructuring. But uh, I think that's a powerful, it's a simple feature, but definitely one uh, that we can all start using uh, ASAP if you're not already. So let's talk a little bit about destructuring. Destructuring is another one of those syntactic pieces that really helps to make everything else um, nicer, a lot, of, a lot of different things nicer uh, as, we're, as we're doing JavaScript development. It's, it's a common use case where we have an object and we actually want to create another object that may use a value from this, from this object that we want to just use in a local variable. We don't, maybe not want to bring the whole object along for the ride. And so I want person.first and I do const, you know, last equals person.last. Right. That was sort of the old way that I used to do those things. Destructuring actually uh, is, a, is a revelation by comparison. The syntax for this is just uh, fantastic. I love it. It can be a little bit confusing to look at at first, but ultimately what you're getting at is you're declaring three variables. Uh, after this concept, you're saying, give me three variables. I, wanna, I want you to take them out of the person object, and the name of those variables are first, last, and Twitter, and they need to come off person.first, person.last, and person.twitter. That is your destructuring. You're taking this complex object on the right-hand side, and you're saying, pull out these three things, give me only them, and give me local constant uh, values as a result of that. What's cool about destructuring is it doesn't stop there. It actually also gives us control over variables and defaults. So if you have a case here where I actually already have a Twitter, ob I already have a Twitter, uh, I have a Twitter const here, and then I want to come down and pull that out of a different object, well, there's a Twitter property here that I want to pull out that's another layer below, how can I do that with destructuring? And the answer there is just to use the colon to reference the uh, value on the object and then the actual variable that I want to name it when it comes out the other side. So now what I'll get is tweet instead of Twitter, sort of remaps it to that variable instead. We can also use destructuring with default values, which is really nice if you are dealing with settings objects, options, options objects in open source libraries where you may not get everything that's coming uh, from the callee of the, of the library, but you still want to provide default values. Destructuring works quite well in that case. Uh, destructuring also works, destructuring works quite well with arrays. Um, destructuring does not work on objects yet. I'll tell you in a little while uh, how we can actually do that. It'll be coming soon enough. Uh, but for now, destructuring with arrays works, works very simple, right? Um, sorry. I was wrong. It does work with objects. I'm, talk I'm thinking about rest and spread. Destructuring with arrays also works very well. Uh, just And you, the syntax is the same, right? Instead of just using the object literal syntax, you're using array syntax and saying, you have an array with these three values. Give me name, ID, and website. And the, with array destructuring, because arrays are not key value pairs, you call these things whatever you want. It just gives you those variables one at a time based on the order that they appear within the array. Destructuring allows us to work with operations that actually return arrays as well. So if I have a collection of common delimited strings and I call data.split, which returns an array, uh, I can pipe that right into the actual values I want rather than getting a temporary array variable, iterating over it, and then getting those values out. We can do cool things with destructuring that also allow us to use the new rest parameter, which I'll talk about uh, in, just a, in just a minute. But effectively, what I can do here, not only can I say, I want certain variables, I want certain values in this array to have a variable name, but I want the rest of the things in that array to be represented in a brand new array that doesn't have the first two values. And so uh, I can say, I have five values here, Brandon, Burke, Todd, Rob, and Brian. I want the first to be captain, second assistant, and the rest will show up as players. So uh, let me go into that one real quick and show you. Go 
over into the console, and I say, Captain, not that. Right? You guys want to see my passwords? Pretty cool. And then players. Uh, so I have a new array that has just those three. I didn't need to do any other messing around in those arrays, anything like that. That worked quite well. Um, destructuring works great with functions like we talked about earlier um, and allows us to, uh, so we, going back to the tip calculator example again, in that case where you're doing the options object, uh, that you have that sort of combination of object destructuring plus default values that allows you to create something that's cleaner, especially for open source libraries. As someone who's consumed a lot of open source, written a lot of open source, I think it's nice to have this syntax so that not only can you communicate to developers how you expect your library to work, but it's easier for people to sort of figure things out without having to necessarily always uh, rely or default on documentation. All right, now let's start to get in. some of the, We've gotten past some of the basic functionality. I wanted to spend some time talking about some more things that I consider to be uh, really, frankly, a little bit uh, mind-blowing, and it starts with iterables. Um, iterables are objects in... JavaScript, not just arrays, because there's been a lot of new types added that are array-like, and there are already existing objects like the arguments object and other, but these are objects in JavaScript that you can iterate over, just like they sound. And the way that that works is actually a little bit counterintuitive. It gives us some new functionality out the other end. But here I actually have an array with several values, uh, as well as a custom property that I've put uh, on the end of that as well. And so if I go to this if I go to this page, and then I go to my console, and I open up cuts, I see something that looks like a, a normal array, right? And it is an array, and I actually can just do a for in for each over it. Uh, but there's actually a new functionality inside of ECMAScript uh, that allows me to do something that I find is even, it, it is interesting, it has its use case, it's not a replacement for these other, uh, these other uses, but it is actually something called getting an iterable from that object. So if I do a const and I do cuts.entries, so there's a few things that you'll see now on array-like objects. There's an entries, a keys, and in the case, and actually the array as well, and values. Um, actually, array doesn't have it, but entries and keys on arrays and other types of iterables that I may be, which we'll talk about in a bit, like maps, uh, have a uh, values as well. So cuts.entries, what that returns to me is something called an array iterator. So what exactly does that look like? If I do it dot, okay, so what it shows me is a couple of just inherited object uh, methods, and then something called next. So what happens if I call it.next? It returns me this object. Interesting. It returns me an object that has a value, so an array value with an index and then the value, and then it returns something else, a, a Boolean, done, okay? So if I, if I call it again, still done, still done, still done, and now it's no, not done. Now it's tr now it's done true, right? What's interesting about this, about the iterator, is it allows me to actually perform operations on a collection without knowing the length or the size of that collection, and it does it in a safe way. I can continue to call next all day long if I really wanted to create a Stack Overflow error in my browser. I can just continue to do that all day long automatically, but it's never actually going to throw an error because it's just giving me an undefined and telling me that I'm done, that this iterator is done. Um, one of the side effects, and you'll see iterators actually will peak up again, and, and keep these in mind. They on, the, on face, maybe not too terribly academically interesting, but you'll see the role they play when we talk about generators, and when we talk about async await, and then we talk about the new for of syntax right now. Because ultimately, that's the power of iterators, is what they provide us the ability to do, is they give us a new for of operator, and for of works with all types that are iterable. So anything that you're working with, if it has a dot entries or dot keys or dot values, that is an iterable type. That means you can throw it in a for of. And for of syntax means we don't need to care about the length of the object. We don't need to care about storing i, j, k looping variables. We just get one at a time, and then we do something to it. The other thing that this gives us, which is really interesting, is it gives us the ability to break and continue, which you can't do inside of for in and for each loops. And so we have the ability to conditionally step outside of an interval whenever we've decided that we're totally done 
and the operation is completed. That's really nice. Uh, and again, like I said, it works with anything that's array-like. So if I go to another example here, and in this case, I have a set of DOM elements. It's just a couple of uh, P tags. And in each of those tags, what I'm effectively doing is I'm calling, I get cuts.entries. And notice I'm using destructuring here as well. I am getting the index. Dot entries will give me each one of those will yield me an array. You saw that in the console with the index and the value. And I'm taking each of those, and I can log those out to the console. Uh, and I can use this for anything that is array-like. And then for my DOM elements, what I can do here is for each one of these paragraph tags that's pulled out by my query selector all statement, again, if you look in the console and I go to PS, see this is an array, and what are these items? Okay, that's cool. There's a lot of stuff here. Each, oh, it's a node list, okay? So PS must have entries. It has entries. So the node list is not an array. It's an array-like type, but because it implements so we'll talk about it in a minute, symbol.iterator, it gives you the ability to iterate over each of those items and do something to it. So in this case, what I can do is I'm adding an event listener that logs to the console each time one of these items is clicked. So if I click here and click there and click there, then those, uh, those all get logged out to the console. All right. So we'll come back to iter iterables in a minute because they play uh, a role elsewhere. A few different array things that are interesting that are worth talking about. Uh, a few new array functions that were added. Array from gives you the ability to create uh, a actual array from something that is array-like, which is very, very cool. One of the best uses for that is the annoying arguments object, if you're still using it, having to use it. Uh, because the arguments object doesn't implement map, reduce, and other array functions, but if you do array.from with arguments, now you have an array of arguments and you can actually do things with it. Uh, array of allows you to convert any arbitrary list of values into an array. These are convenience functions by and large. There's also array sum and array every. Array sum gives you a Boolean value if some of the things uh, pass the condition. So you'll notice here, arrow functions are fantastic for doing this kind of stuff because it's just quick conditions, quick filtering. In the old days, I would have to do a complete function declaration in there. It's nice and compact. It looks fantastic. Uh, and then array, excuse me, array dot every, everything in there has to pass a condition. Uh, you also have the ability, I think this one is actually kind of nice, they've given you convenience functions on arrays to actually find items within arrays themselves. And uh, no surprise for some of you that are, are, are familiar and use uh, lodash or underscore. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt that the, some of the functionality that we've got built in has taken its inspiration from how popular those libraries and that interface has been with doing these kinds of operations on complex objects. But if you're looking for something inside, so I have a name of a beer uh, that I want, and that is actually really a name for a, a name of a beer, believe it or not. Um, and I want to find the actual object that has that name, then I can do dot find, again, of the condition, or I can get find index, and it gives me the, con gives me the actual index of that object uh, so that I can then go and work with it. Again, convenience functions are worth looking into a little bit more. Now, spread and rest. Uh, spread and rest are fun because they have the exact same syntax and they mean something kind of slightly different. So I'll try to explain them in a way that is both correct and that I understand when I'm done telling you what I think that they mean. Uh, the new spread operator is effectively used to take an array of values and spread them out into another object, into another array. So if we have a couple of different arrays uh, featured in specialty pizzas and we want to add another one, we can create a new object and we spread the features uh, uh, items in there, we add the veggie, and we spread the special items in there, and they go in in the exact same order. And we can use that for combining values. Um, I, I have a few React examples in here because I'm biased. This is what I do for my day job right now, but I do think that um, I like these so much because they come up a lot when you're doing React, React and Redux kind of development, uh, at least when you're doing it like me, which is poorly every day. So. Um, Spread also gives you the ability to work it within functions. So if I have a couple of different uh, arrays and I want to call push, right? Push actually accepts any number of arguments that you want to send it. We typically use push to push one item at a time on an array, but you can put 20 common delimited items uh, into, that, uh, into that array. You do dot, 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 and you're basically spreading those values into the, ar into the arguments for the array. And it works with your own functions as well. It's not just uh, the built-ins. 
Now, another, now rest is the opposite. Rest is designed to take an object and represent its collection of items as an array. That's it. That's ultimately it. So we're having, in this case, and you'll see this a lot in functions. Again, you see it a lot in certain cases in React. But if I'm calling a function, like in this case, log names, and I, I know that the first value is going to be the captain, the second value is going to be the coach, and then I just want you to give me the rest, the rest of those arguments, and represent them for me as an array. So when I call log names, I'm getting coaches, Sarah, Captain Benjamin, and then team Jack, Matthew, Brandon. The rest just shows up uh, as that separate object. Uh, this can work with destructuring assignments as well. So if I have an object or an array, and I want to put that, sorry, in this case, it's just arrays. Uh, rest and spread don't yet work with objects. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want variables that I want to assign to the first two, and then I want the rest to go in another array. Uh, I can use that as a part of destructuring as well. A couple of real-world examples where you, where you tend to see this in React applications. Uh, and this is, uh, this is real code that I've written. So if you have comments, criticisms, I just put my Twitter account up earlier. I'll take pull requests right here, right now. Um, so I have a private route component. And I know that on the route, because I'm effectively passing props down to some other component, this is a higher order component that I am ultimately wrapping other components, I don't know what parameters you're going to send me, so I'm just going to send you the rest of them. I'm just going to send them on down the line if you're properly authenticated. If not, I'm redirecting you, and that tends to be really common. Another example where um, I see I use spread a lot personally is in using Redux and dealing with state transformations on an object. So in this case, I have a function that actually removes an item from a collection. Uh, and this is a really nice way to actually use, uh, use, use slice uh, and, sp and spread together, because I can actually take all, if I have a collection of items, and if I'm updating state, effectively what I'm saying is give me, and in this case, excuse me again, rest. I'm confusing myself right here. Um, give me all the items up to the index of the item I want to remove, and then give me the rest of them. That's it, right there. So now I have a new object. I'm replacing state, handling it that way. Um, spread, in other cases, tends to be dealt, tend to be used in the case of reducers in Redux, where uh, I am attempting to show, um, where I'm uh, att attempting to basically update the state uh, strategically in a targeted way without re without replicating details equals action dot details redirect equals blah blah you know without calling that over and over again what I can basically say with a, with a uh, spread parameter is with give me all the state that's come in to this action I said reduce earlier I meant action uh, and then update the details the redirect to refer and off called the rest of the state just give me the whole thing and that's it so there's a couple of examples if you've seen react um, and then hopefully it already makes sense to you, but just a few cases where that ends up getting used. So let's go back to generators, because this is where I think things start to get really exciting uh, in the last 20 minutes or so that we have, because we're getting beyond just syntactic sugar, things that make our lives easier, but really some mind-blowing stuff that, uh, that JavaScript is able to do now that we haven't been able to do with the language previously. And so um, the syntax, this is effectively, generator is a concept that allows us to implement functions that actually pause and resume. They can actually pause their execution until we call them again. They no longer operate independently and do whatever the heck they want, and we just got to deal with it. Uh, they allow us to, to basically say, stop right here until someone calls you again, and then go into your thing again. So let me show you exactly what this looks like when it comes to interacting with a generator. Oh, yes, you can. I moved generators up earlier. That's why I couldn't. I wanted to talk about them like ASAP. So I have this, I have this function here called list some numbers. And you'll notice my syntax here has a couple of things. It's got the asterisk before the function name. Um, syntactically, you can either put it like right after the function name without a space, or like right in the middle with a space, or like right, it's just whatever. Just, you know, be consistent internally in your own head, in your own code, and within your team. But you have those options. You just got to have an asterisk there somewhere. And then you use the yield statement to say, return a value, pause execution. That's ultimately what you're saying. So when I, when I create a, when I basically call that, what happens is 
I move to the first yield statement effectively and just wait. Don't do anything until something else happens that you're going to see is familiar in just a moment. So if I call list some numbers by itself, I see the function, right? But if I call it as a function, I see, okay, this is interesting. I've got a generator status of suspended. So this is a generator type. Um, I see some other information about it, where, it's, where it is uh, defined, what its scopes are, but I, I, what its scopes are, but I define that to, or excuse me, I added that to a variable called nums, right? So again, same thing. So what's on nums that I can call? Well, you see it already, a next. So just like you saw earlier with iterators, I can actually call generator nums.next, and I get the first value, right? I can call nums.next again, and now I get a value of one. So what's happening in each of these cases is I'm waiting right here. So when I first do nums equals list some numbers, the function goes let i equals zero, goes right to the beginning of that yield and stops and waits. And then I say dot next, and it says, cool, here's a zero. And then it goes i plus plus. Okay, now it's one, and then it stops. Right? And then I call it again. Okay, i plus plus. And then it stops, and it waits. And you notice what I get for free in this is that it knows it's not done. It continues to give me the done is false value until I call it one more time, and now that I know I'm done. Um, I think this is actually really cool. There are a lot of really great applications for this. A lot of the ones that you'll see online, because they make a ton of sense, is it makes it a heck of a lot easier for us to do asynchronous REST calls and to deal with libraries that may be long running, need to run in parallel. We're really trying to get the best performance that we can without completely just being one thread at a time in JavaScript and just waiting for things to execute. So uh, this, is, this here is, again, same thing. I, I don't have to just hard code yield statements, obviously. If I have a collection of items and I want to create another generator that then loops over those and yield one item at a time, now effectively what I'm doing is I'm like wrapping another iterator around a generator. It's a little bit of a fake example, but I don't, I'm not hard coding these. In this case, I'm defining the yield one value at a time, and then you're just calling that, calling that generator and taking uh, the values that I give you. Now, of course, one great area where we can use this is in our AP, making our API calls look more synchronous. So I will spend in, in promises next in just a second, talk a little bit more about using the new built-in fetch if you haven't already um, and what that means. But you can actually take generators and wrap all this promise functionality with fetch and then converting to JSON, uh, et cetera, and actually chain multiple calls together. So I create a wrapper function that takes in a URL and it fetches it. And then it converts that to the data.json, JSON, Burke, I said it, JSON, and then it calls next. So it actually says, okay, now I'm ready for you to go to the next yield statement in the generator after you get the JSON, Burke, and then I'm gonna, and then I have a catch in case there is an issue. So with that wrapper, I can actually create my generator function. So this wrapper only calls the generator. This is my generator function. And so what I've done here is I have an API to call the React Beer API. And I have a yield statement in front of that, right? So basically, again, when I call this and when I start it, which I have down here, I call generator steps and generator.next. This kicks this off, calls this, and then goes and waits for me to call next again, which happens up here, right? So once that URL comes back, I have my generator, I go to the next one, I go to the next one. All of the promisey stuff, all of the callbacky kind of stuff that we're used to in JavaScript is still happening, but I get code out the other side that actually looks a little bit more synchronous, that is just linear. I kind of tend to know more of what's happening, and I don't worry that these things are blocking one another. They are literally just, they're moving in waterfall form, just one at a time. I'm getting one, waiting for the next one, and I don't have nested, nested, nested callbacks. Or in some cases, it tends to happen now, I don't even have nested uh, nested then catch statements. So uh, I'll show you really what you get with that is what you would expect, right? The generator is just doing its thing. It's calling those values. And I think, did it get all three? Yeah, it did. Okay. Hold that all in your mind because, again, like not many of us are going to want to use generators to implement these generic wrappers, but it's going to come back up in a second in a, a new way that we can do promises.
Uh, but speaking of promises, if you haven't seen these yet, this is effectively just a new way of avoiding callback hell like I just talked about. You saw it a little bit. What we tend to use, uh, what we can do with promises basically is to avoid the traditional case of where we would call something and have sort of the, call it Ajax and then URL and then here's our, here's our callback with the function and we got to do this and that and and it just goes on and on and on, right? We can actually just use native fetch, which returns a promise. And what a promise is, is it's basically, just like it sounds, it is a promise that that thing will probably return you either a value or an error at some undetermined point in the future, and it's not going to tell you when. You, gotta, you just find out. You wait, and it'll let you know when it's done. And the way that that's called, and what we refer to promises sometimes are called thenables. Anything that implements a promise that returns a promise is a thenable object, because you can then say, okay, now give me this promise, and then, and then, and then, until it's done returning thenables, and a dot catch if there's ultimately an issue. We can use catch uh, to, to catch if problems when and if they do occur. And the beautiful thing about that is that we can have those catch statements we can do multiple calls to multiple promises and be 100 lines down the page and just have a single catch statement that only fails when it is uh, appropriate to do so. Creating promises is really easy. And this is something you'll see it with Fetch. You'll see it with a lot of other libraries, uh, especially libraries that, are, that, are, that do network calls, is that you just return a new promise object from any call, from any function, any object, any function. Return a promise. The promise takes in a function with two parameters, a resolve and a reject, right? And then the way that you re resolve the promise is by calling the resolve function and passing in a return value or rejecting that and passing in an error, right? Any object that returns a promise can then be called with dot then and then ultimately is a good practice called with dot catch. Multiple promises, and this tends to be one of the most common use cases. A lot of times when we're writing code or writing applications that interact with APIs, a lot of times those aren't, those aren't just calling one API. It's not just one thing that's happening at a time. Sometimes we want those things to run in parallel because they don't depend on one another. We want to get the response back as, as fast as possible so, that we so we deliver users a great user experience. And one of the ways that we can do that is by doing promise.all. Promise.all takes an array of other promises that it then goes and calls, it just waits for to complete. So effectively what dot all does is it calls internally, calls, calls whether dot then, waits for result, calls whether dot tweets, and then sends both of those responses up into an array of responses, which we can now cleanly destructure into two variables called weather info and tweet info. Uh, and log those out to the console. And in this case, what we're seeing with all is like, I don't care when these things happen, just do them at the same time. There's no dependency on one another. Uh, promise also has a dot race, uh, which just like it sounds, you can basically say, give me a promise that's either resolved or directed when one of these two things is done, right? Um, so if you have a use case where you're actually trying to get uh, you know, maybe you're actually dealing with CDNs and you don't know which one is going to be faster. You call both at the same time. As soon as you get a result from one, you stop the other one, but you get that fastest response back ahead of time. Now, a lot of times what we tend to do with, uh, with API calls, because APIs tend to be very uh, microservice-like, I think that's like we all do that today. Like APIs are really small, right? Like you call something with an ID and you get back like one piece of data and you got to call like five other APIs to get like four more pieces of data. Uh, so we do that a lot. There's a lot of cases where we are working with multiple calls and we need data from one call to chain into the next call so that, that can give us a complete piece of information. So I have a, a set of posts here with authors. Uh, and for each of those authors, I have their name and I have the ID of the post. And then I have an author's object that has a little bit more information about those authors. And ultimately, what I want to do is when I get my collection of posts, I want to take that author name and replace it with the actual author's object. And so I'll create a couple of promises that do this. One promise to get the post by ID. Shouldn't be anything surprising here to see. Again, I'm resolving the post when I get the right by ID. And then a hydrate author, which takes a post, it finds the author by their name, by the name I provide from the post, and then it just replaces the author variable. Oh, you hear that? Something cool is happening right now. It's probably Ragnarok, like right now. 
Uh, post on author is replaced. Instead of that string, it's author details. And then I resolve that and return it back. And so now what I can do again, because this is thenable, I can call get post by ID, then take the post and hydrate the author, then log it out, and I have a console log at the end. And what that gives me out the other side chaining promises. What that gives me out the other side is Burke's blog post about how much he loves Star Wars, and instead of his, a string of his name is an object uh, that represents that instead. So quite useful in that regard. Um, I'm going to skip over modules. I actually want to talk about symbols. This is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, this could be in the territory of like, wow, I didn't realize JavaScript had that. It's weird, and I don't know what to do with it, because that's kind of the way that I feel about symbols. Uh, there is a new primitive type in, in, in ES6. It's called the symbol. Uh, what is it? It's a symbol. Why do you, why do you have to ask? It's, it's a symbol. Um, it is part of something called a global symbol registry. So ECMAScript, all the engine implementations now have a global registry that represents a unique store of these symbol values, as well as something that allows you to extend and override built-ins, which I'll talk about in just a second. But one of the things that this allows you to do is to create keys for object literals that don't collide. So symbol, if I create something Go back over, no, not Spotify, not right now. Go back over to the console <clears throat> and go into my symbols. And I create something called symbol. And notice here I didn't actually use new symbol. You don't use new. Uh, you'll get a failure if you call new. But if this gives me a symbol. And if I call it again, and if I call symbol new equals, 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 symbol These are not equal. These are, this is not equal at all. Uh, the string value I pass in is for me. Uh, it's stored that way in the registry, but it's irrelevant in terms of what that symbol's value actually is. What is that symbol's value? Only JavaScript knows. You're never going to find out. Uh, but it is, it is useful for you to use for creating keys for object literals when you're worried about having collision problems. The problem with this is that if I have classroom, a classroom value, right? You'll notice here that I did create a symbol here that I, 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 I maintained a reference to, uh, but then others that I did not. So I can actually access classroom.brandon and get a value, but if I do classroom symbol mark, uh, I get undefined. Because even though that's in there, symbol mark does not equal symbol mark as I defined it earlier, so you can't do anything with that. Now, you can... You can't iterate over them either. If I do a for and over classroom, I get nothing. I've got it uncommented. It's not doing anything on the console. What you can do is actually instead use the get own property symbols method that is new to get each of those and actually then map over them. And you can print them out to the console. So you do have access to those symbols. But again, look in this case here. So I'll go up a little bit. Uh, in this case here, I, the symbol doesn't actually show up anywhere, right? The ID is just a 0, 1, 2, 3 in what I've gotten, but I don't actually have access to that symbol. It's effectively a private member. It's given me the ability to define these, and I can access them, but I can't really do much with them. Symbols are actually a really, really fun way to also access object internals, which is kind of like still messing with my head a little bit as I think about it. Uh, and we'll go back to our good friend, the iterator, and the generator and the symbol will sort of bring some things together right here. Um, I can actually have this object here called conference. And it has name and dates property as well as a collection of speakers. Now, I can't do a for of on conference because it's not an iterable. There is no dot entries iterator on an object by default. But that's OK. That doesn't have to stop me. Because if I add a symbol dot iterator generator function on here, I can actually yield the name and then the dates and then do a for of of the speakers and print all of those out to the console. And I use the generator syntax. I use the reserved symbol.iterator name. And there are a lot of these functions if you actually look. Uh, there's anything that is implemented by default on objects, you can override uh, or access using symbol. Split, species, search, all, replace, all kinds of different stuff that you can do and implement on objects that you create of your own, even if they're not available. So if I now load this up, you see that I've actually been able to do, I just did a for of, 
on the object, I got the name, I got the dates, and I got the individual speakers all in a single for of without me having to do as the implementer of that object. I added an iterator, and then the consumer was able just to loop over those, treat it like a normal iterator, uh, which, is, which is really, really kind of awesome. So I'm going to, I'm going to, in the last few minutes that I have, I'm actually going to talk about async await because it, it, re, it goes back to what we've talked about with generators and iterators as well. And I'll mention, I've got a whole lot of stuff in here today. Uh, I meant to say at the beginning, I could have easily spent 500 minutes talking about uh, ES6, 7, and 8 as opposed to the hour that I have so far. And I have a lot of just quick samples and demo code in this library. I will put up on GitHub and I'll, I'll share the link for it. Uh, at the end, so you can go check these out and see anything that you wanted to go back to or even anything that I didn't have a chance to talk to. Uh, but remember a little while ago, I actually, used, I actually used a generator to make Ajax look more synchronous. And this is actually what we get in async await, which is an ECMAScript 8 feature, which just got finalized this summer. But it is something that we can start using in some places and we'll start to be using uh, a whole lot more now. So what this ends up looking like is I can take wrap an existing promise, and if any, any function that returns a promise will be compatible with async and await. And the way that this effectively looks is I take a function, any function, and I put async on the front, right in front of the function name. If it's an arrow function, it goes right before the, uh, the, curly, the, um, the parentheses. And then any time that I want to pause execution, this is starting to look familiar, any time I want to pause execution, I just say await. So I'm, I'm awaiting the result of the breathe function and I'm putting it here. And I'm awaiting, I'm calling it again. I'm calling it again and I'm just waiting. I call go and I'm just waiting for a response. And what's actually happening in the promise is that I'm calling a set timeout that waits for that amount that's passed in and then it returns a resolve or if there's an error, it returns a reject. And that's it, right? So we're still using promises under the covers, but it gives us the ability to very quickly, again, write clean, readable JavaScript that we know that this is, a, this is something we're stopping and pausing execution for to wait for a response to come back. Now, async and await works really well with multiple promises as well. It is not uh, an issue to do that even with things like a map, right? So if I have a set of promises that are coming from a fetch, so I do, I have a, a set of names that I want to get their GitHub profile and then go ahead and do the then to get the JSON object. And then I want to I put those all into a collection of promises, ob, or a, a promises array, and I call promise.all. I just put in a wait in front, a wait in front of that. Make sure the function is decorated with async. And now all I'm doing is calling get data. All three of those calls are happen. It waits, logs them all out to the console. Uh, and that's really nice. Promises can also be really, really useful to do things like uh, wrapping native functionality that we may otherwise be tired of dealing with. Uh, I, used to, I used to be an evangelist for Microsoft, and I spent a lot of time giving demos and talks about HTML5. And so this one is near and dear to my heart because when I was at Microsoft and we were about to do IE, like the best thing the browser had going for it was that you could do geolocation in the browser, which today seems like, wow, that's like, wow, well, we like, like six, seven years ago. It's great. Uh, but we talked about it a lot because there, it was at the time where there was a lot of really great stuff happening in a lot of the browsers, Internet Explorer included. And geolocation is a callback-based piece of functionality. It still is. That's how it's implemented today. And with get current position, you pass in the success and then a failure, uh, failure callback whether it worked or not. We can actually wrap this in a promise. So we want to call it the same thing. Again, just pass along the arguments object via a rest parameter. We return a new promise and then we just defer args resolve and reject to the resolve and reject that come in from the promise to the geolocation object. And so then in order to use await async, we'd have to have a top-level function that is decorated with async. But effectively, we just say, hey, await get current position, and then give me the result. And that's it. And now we have not only promisified uh, an older API, and you can do this all over the place, but we've gotten something that uses async await and can really be quite readable. <clears throat> Now, in the one minute I have left, I will tell you, when it comes to using a lot of this functionality in the browsers today, your best friend is Babel, or Babel. I don't know how it's pronounced. I'll call it Babel, because I like it. Um, Babel, if you're using React, if you're using React App, if you're using Angular, I don't know about Vue, 
Uh, maybe, probably, but, uh, you know, Babel is in the box with a lot of these, so you are, you do have the ability to write everything that I just shared today is available. As long as you're targeting modern browsers, a lot of this stuff is already implemented, and if you have to go back, you do have some options. So there is a great polyfill service out there called polyfill.io, which gives you things that you may not have in an older browser if you're supporting an older version of Safari, if you're still supporting uh, IE789, even 10 in some cases. And polyfill.io is actually really cool because it gives you what you need based on the browser that you're actually requesting with. So if I request with Chrome 62, cool, you don't have any polyfills because Chrome implements everything like before it's standardized, which is maybe not always great, but hey, it's cool. Um, I can actually show you what this looks like in another browser, and I'll do network conditions, and everybody always picks on IE, so let's just go to like, um, we'll do like an older version of Safari. Dang it. All right, fine, IE8. Dang it. I didn't want to do it. Sorry. Uh, and then I refresh the page, so now it's acting like IE8. You see, I have a lot of stuff now that I've added in here. Polyfills.io is giving me object to find property, the array iterator, object to sign, all this kind of stuff. It's all in there, packed in there for me now, and only for the browser that needs it. Uh, check out polyfill.io. So there's no reason not to use these things today. If you go to Babel, Babel, sure, babeljs.io, and you can try out these things to see the JavaScript that comes out the other end, uh, definitely do check out. At the, uh, when you get a chance, I'll put these slides up on GitHub. Uh, they'll be at github.com slash bsatrum. If you have a minute, please do take some time to write this session. And please go check out all the wonderful things in ECMAScript 6, 7, and 8. There is so much more than I talked about today, but dig deeper into what we talked about today and anything else that catches your fancy. Thank you very much.